Welcome to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons Roundtable. I'm Caitlin Clark, and I'm joined by three renowned plastic surgeons and ASPS members. Dr. Karen Horton, who practices in San Francisco and is internationally board certified in plastic surgery by both the American Board of Plastic Surgery and the Royal College of Surgeons of Canada, and has a practice in San Francisco. Dr. Troy Pittman, who is an award-winning plastic surgeon in Washington, DC, with a focus on aesthetic and reconstructive surgery of the body. And he also serves as an assistant professor of plastic and reconstructive surgery at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And Dr. David Sieber, a double board certified plastic surgeon with a body centric practice in San Francisco and the recipient of the inaugural Frederick Brandt Scholarship Award in recognition of his commitment to the ongoing education and training of aesthetic physicians. And we're all here today to talk about whether men getting plastic surgery is becoming destigmatized or whether it's still taboo. To get started, last year's ASPS stats showed that men seeking plastic surgery declined in 2020. But anecdotally, we've been hearing from dozens of surgeons that they are seeing more male patients than ever before. So let's start with Dr. Sieber. You're known for your body procedures, especially with men. Has your practice always been male heavy? Uh, no, I don't think it's been male heavy necessarily, but I always have uh, maybe a higher percentage of men in my practice than what you would see nationally. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think San Francisco in general is just kind of a younger community. Um, and we have a lot of uh, tech here, of course. So the, the tech people tend to be, um, I think, and I don't know the statistics on this, but I think that they tend to be more male heavy in the tech industry. Um, which leads to, you know, having maybe a higher percentage of uh, male patients. Um, there's also a larger gay population here, of course. There's basically a lot of stress to continue to look good, to look young, to have a nice physique. So I think that also leads itself to having, uh, you know, a larger male population in general. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Horton, you mentioned off camera previously that most of your male patients are the husbands of friends of the wives that you operated on. Do you feel like there's still a hush-hush factor with male plastic surgery? I definitely think there is. Uh, most male patients who come to see me, they don't necessarily want anyone to know. Like, of course, if it's one of my uh, female patients' husbands, of course, she'll know. But when I say, hey, like you should, should tell some of your other dad friends about your procedure, they're like, no way. So I definitely think there is stigma. And I agree with what Dr. Sieber said about being in San Francisco. It's very techie. I'd say that the two types of men that I see in consultation are either dads, maybe they have a little bit of dad bod um, after having a couple of kids and they're not exercising as much as they used to be, or they work in tech or both, or the gay male population, which they tend to be very body focused, just like women are. And so um, I do think, unfortunately, there is stigma. Uh, hopefully that's changing because we are starting to see more non-surgical patients come in to see our nurse practitioner. Um, I would say that about fifth, only about 5% of my total patients are men. I asked Emily uh, what she thinks her total percentage of men is, and she said about 10, but it's, it's increasing every year. So unfortunately, I do think there is stigma. Um, it would be great if there wasn't, but you know, people are very private, and San Francisco is a small town. So Dr. Pittman, you are on the other opposite coast in uh, Washington, D.C. And so do you agree? Do you feel like um, more men are getting plastic surgery than ever before? Yeah, it's so interesting to hear, um, you know, about plastic surgery being stigmatized amongst men because D.C. is a small town. It's a very traditionally private town. But I'm seeing a lot more men. Um, I think a lot more men are having plastic surgery because a lot more men are talking about plastic surgery. And so my experience is a little bit different in that um, although I do see a lot of husbands of uh, women that I've operated on, um, a lot of men are being referred by their friends. And um, like the other two speakers, I have a very large gay population, um, probably a disproportionately large gay male population um, as far as plastic surgery goes. Um, and we're seeing that you know, guys are out to brunch and they're talking about what they want to have done and what they've had done. And they're kind of educating each other. Um, I can remember seeing um, four consultations for pec augmentation in a week. And finally, the last guy, I said, where are you all coming from all of a sudden? Like, what did I do um, in my social media that was so targeted to getting pec augmentation patients? And it was really a table 
of six guys at brunch all talking about PEC augmentation, and then they all made consults. So I do think we're seeing higher proportions of men because men are talking to each other about it. Mm -hmm. And so that is leading them to then book a consult with you and come in. That's are right. they asking for non-invasive procedures or in that specific case, they were asking for um, an actual surgery, but do you feel like in general, they're asking for surgeries or are they, you know, dipping a toe in starting with the non-invasive treatments first? Well, I think always Botox is a gateway drug. And so people come in, they, uh, patients are asking for uh, an injectable to start off with. Um, and it just kind of, as they get more comfortable with being in the office, as they're more educated by us, we, we try and use all of those touch points as uh, opportunities to educate the patients as to what we do. It kind of organically evolves. And then there are other patients who come in and they say, I have, li I li have love handles and I want liposuction. Mm -hmm. And now Dr. Sieber, how about you? I know you have a med spa attached to your practice. Is that right? And so are you finding that um, men are going straight into the surgeries or are they starting first with the non-invasive? We get a little bit of both in my practice. I mean, I would say it's probably um, more typical for the patients to come in for surgery first, because just like Troy had said that they have a friend who did it, they look good, they feel good. Um, I've done uh, couples together who both want to have surgery at the same time. And then what happens is once you do surgery on someone and they trust you and you did a good job and they, they feel like, you know, they know you, they trust people in your practice, then uh, a lot of the patients do go and see my PA then for um, laser treatments, to make their skin look good, to, for Botox, for fillers, and kind of go in that way. I'd say that in general, I see more people have surgery first and then go into the non-surgical route as opposed to having non-surgical patients convert into surgical patients. Mm, that's so interesting. And do they um, speak to you about their motivations for starting with surgery rather than the other way around? Yeah, I mean, the motivation of surgery, especially when it comes to men, is always the same. Um, they have a little bit of stubborn fat, a lot of people diet and exercise. Um, I don't see a lot of male patients who are you know, huge. It's just like a little bit of like a tune up. Like they want to have the little bit of uh, stubborn belly fat. Um, you know, guys hate their love handles. Um, so they really want to get rid of their love handles, no matter what they're doing in the gym, no matter um, how much dieting they do, they can't get rid of it. So with a quick, you know, couple hour procedure, they can take care of that. Got it. And so is it mostly liposuction that you're doing with men or what would you say the top three procedures are? Yeah, so the, the top three would be just general liposuction. So that would be liposuction, the abdomen, the flanks, the chest. Um, and then kind of a corollary to that would be gynecomastia surgery, which is going to be removing some of the glandular tissue, also doing some liposuction in the chest. And then the third surgical procedure I think I see most commonly with men would be um, eyelid surgery. So they just feel like um, they're not ready for facelift. They don't want something that looks overdone, but they do notice that when they are on Zoom meetings or look in the mirror, that their eyes are starting to kind of make them look uh, tired and older. And it's something that's really easy to do to kind of tune things up. So the Zoom effect is still very much a thing. And Dr. Horton, how about you? What are the top three procedures that men are coming to you to reconcile? Um, I would agree with what David said. I say that liposuction, body, abdomen, flanks, pubic area, gynecomastia reduction, and then um, in addition to eyelid surgery, I'm actually doing um, more neck lifts on male patients. And they, they want to look natural. They don't want to look done. Often they have short hair and they're they can be very self-conscious of the scar. But um, apparently we have passed the grandchild test. Some of my older male patients came back from an, an outing with their grandkids. And they said, even though I still had a little bit of a scab, nobody noticed. And I said, that's great. So I think just like many of our female patients, our male patients, they, they want to look like themselves. They want to look normal. They want to look natural, but they just want to age gracefully in their own way going forward. So I would, I would agree with those. And then non-surgically Botox fillers, cool sculpting, and then laser rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess with men as well, you can maybe see this, the scars a little bit more prominently because they have, they tend to have shorter hair. Is there something special that you do to hide the scars or is there more of a scar reduction or a preventative treatment that you do? That's a good question. I think it really depends on what their skin tone is like. So how much melanin, how much, how much skin pigment they have in their skin, anyone who has more melanin, their scars can be darker, a little bit longer. And I will speak to men about using concealer. If their scars are dark, particularly 
for body procedures, for liposuction. So I usually say um, after we've taught them about scar therapy, and that includes massaging the scars, using a topical scar gel that contains medical grade silicone, also has sunblock in it, but it won't conceal hyperpigmentation or darker coloring of scars. So I'll tell even my male patients say, hey, listen, go to the MAC Cosmetics counter. They have a little private area where they can color match you, you know, show them your scar and they will color match you with a waterproof concealer that you can wear at the beach or if you're wearing a shirt where your scars might be showing and it'll get you through the waiting period, which could take a year, sometimes longer until your scars fade naturally. Also, um, male skin tends to be more oily. It has more sebaceous glands and often the quality of the scars is, is even nicer. Oh, that's so interesting. What a nice benefit for them. <laughs> um, and Dr. Pittman, you mentioned that you are seeing a lot of pec implants. Is that something that is more of a recent trend or have you always seen that in your practice? I think that pec implants um, have always been around. It's been something that, that men have not traditionally talked about. Um, and I think as we're uh, with social media, with, um, with guys really talking to each other about it, doing their own research, being able to reach out and find anything on the internet, they're getting that information. Um, interestingly enough, one of the procedures that I've done more of in the last year on men specifically are otoplasties or ear pinning. And I don't think guys were looking at their ears before COVID. And there is a phenomenon about sitting on a Zoom call and guys will come in for liposuction of their flanks. And while they're in the consult, they'll say, while I'm back there, can you pin my ears back? Um, because I notice they're sticking out. And I really think that it's this whole Zoom awakening where you, you're looking at yourself in a mirror all day long. Because I don't think guys were thinking about their ears five years ago. I'm convinced of it. <laughs> also the lighting is usually terrible it's a bad angle and you're looking at yourself like that mm -hmm. it's really bad anyone could look horrible on zoom <sighs> yeah i feel like more people look bad than look good for sure yeah um, how about noses nobody's talked about noses i don't i don't do rhinoplasty in my practice but that's always traditionally been a very popular male procedure dr Pittman, do you, are you seeing more rhinoplasties well, my partner does all the rhinoplasties in the practice, and um, certainly there is, uh, I would say in his practice, men versus women with rhinoplasties is about 40% men, 60% women. Hmm. And for the, back to the otoplasties, do you feel like the masks have had um, a negative impact on our ears, like maybe tugging or pulling that's made it a little, maybe a little bit worse? <laughs> well, you know, that's a really good point. And I think that, um, whether or not the mask has been pulling the ears away from the head, making them look more prominent, or, or we're just really thinking about our ears more because there's irritation behind the ears. The masks, when you have the mask on, it makes the ear look more prominent if you're wearing an ill-fitting mask. And so, yeah, I think that's a great point that, you know, maybe we're thinking about our ears more because we have masks behind our ears. And Dr. Sieber, um, these procedures that you said were most popular, do you expect them to continue to be popular? Yeah, I don't see any reason why they would um, decrease at all. I'm um, kind of going back to the whole stigma thing. I think, and I was thinking about this the other day, I think both for men and women, um, kind of like Troy had said, San Francisco similarly is a very private town where people um, like to have things done, don't like to talk about it. Um, and uh, I think the stigma is, is decreasing a little bit in certain groups, but I think there is in general still a stigma associated with having plastic surgery. I mean, I was having my hair cut the other day and the lady there, I told her I was a plastic surgeon and immediately she started saying, oh, well, all, you know, all your patients must be difficult. They must be, you know, difficult to deal with and all this other stuff. And I go, no, listen, I don't think you understand. Um, we love all of our patients. Most of them are, are just come in. There's something little that's bothering them and we can fix it. And they're so gracious and so happy you're able to do that. And, you know, same thing with the men, men come in with a little issue, you fix it. And they're super, super grateful that you were able to help them with whatever they're dealing with. You immediately see an improvement in their, in their, um, you know, self-worth, so, you know, how they present themselves, how they carry themselves, clothes they wear. A lot of men get very, very self-conscious about how their clothing fits, especially men with gynecomastia or a little bit of fat in their stomach. And you can tell because they come in for their follow-ups and they have these you know, tight fitting clothes, stuff that they'd never wear before prior to surgery. And that's just so great to see. 
Mm -hmm. Because men have the same insecurities as women do. It's easy to think that just because they're men, they, they don't have a stubborn pocket of fat or an area that really bothers them, you know, just the same as women. And I think, you know, along those lines, traditionally, I mean, when I was in training, I can remember, um, really male patients were stigma, male plastic surgery patients were stigmatized by, by plastic surgeons. And there was this whole idea of the, um, the, the Simon, the single immature, uh, narcissistic, obsessive compulsive male who comes in. And I remember one of my attendings saying to me, you know, 15 years ago, if you see a man come into your plastic surgery office, run in the opposite direction because they're all narcissistic and they're all crazy. Um, and I do think that there was that, that idea, but it was only because plastic surgeons weren't seeing men. And so for every 30 women that came into the office, there was one man. And because it was, it was really our problem as plastic surgeons, because we didn't really know how to tailor a consult toward a man. We didn't really understand the insecurities of men um, in the same way. And so that was more difficult for the surgeon. So it was displaced onto the patient. Whereas, you know, when you hear all of us talking, a male plastic surgery patient is a normal part of the day. Mm -hmm. And so and I would say that the, the males are almost even for me during consults, maybe even easier to see than my female patients. I mean, I know as like a male, if I want a new shirt, I know what shirt I want. I go to the store and I buy it and I come home. Um, and the men are kind of the same. They come in, they know what they want. They talk to you about it. You tell them the risk of complications and then that's it. They're done. And it, it's almost, um, for me, the consults are uh, faster, more straightforward when dealing with male patients. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. You know, my relationship with my male patients is, is very different from my female patients. My female patients, I get to know them. It's kind of like a friend and we talk about their family and their work. And then we get to whatever body part they want to talk about. With men, they know, okay, I know I want this. You know, I've looked you up. I know where you train. I've seen your before and afters. You know, I just, I'm here to decide, like, do I like you? Yeah, you're good. Okay, what's your schedule? Uh, how much? <laughs> and yeah. it's very transactional, even though I still, I get to know my male patients, but it's on a different level than with female patients. I totally agree with you. It makes me think that then they are a lot more decisive. So they've been thinking about these surgeries perhaps longer than they would probably like to admit. Whereas... I feel like a lot of women that I've spoken to who have gotten plastic surgery kind of molded over, but really were a little bit indecisive or maybe um, waited a little bit longer than they would have would have liked to. Are you, are you finding that as well, that they are very decisive and they come in knowing exactly what they want? I think so. I think they're usually ready to schedule. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know how long they've actually researched for. I forget what the actual um, number was as far as how it's like, 18 months or 25 months or something. It's a long time. People actually do research before they come in to book a consultation with a plastic surgeon. And I, and I have to imagine it's probably similar with men. They're still doing their kind of due diligence to check everything out. Kind of like Karen alluded to, like they've, they've done the research, they know all about you, they've come in. So I, I think they're, they're not, they, it's not like they come in, they haven't researched anything. They've still researched you, but they're just, they've made up their mind and they're like ready to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ready to pull the trigger. Yeah. And how long is it usually between consult and surgery? I, I know it's wildly different for everyone, but do they want their they want their booking as fast as possible? Dr. I think, I think in general, people now coming in the office want surgery as soon as possible, but um, it just depends on what your schedule is. I mean, for me, it takes a little while before you know we can have surgery. Yeah. Yeah, I think certainly for guys because they do come in and they know exactly what they want. You know, my female patients, we are doing a lot of scheduling around school schedules. And, um, you know, women tend to put everyone else before themselves. And so it's always kind of we're juggling holidays and birthdays. And so we book them out much longer because they have so many things going on. Whereas men come in and once they decide they want it, and, and like Karen was saying, once they see the price and they know they're ready to purchase, I mean, they would go the next day if it was available. They just want to get it over with and they want to move forward. So they are much more decisive and then it becomes all about them. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Pittman, you mentioned with the group of men who came in for the one surgery, are you finding that men in general are maybe a little more shy 
um, when it comes to their surgeries or they don't want anyone to know, or are they, I, they're not probably at the point where they're broadcasting it on social media, but are, are you finding that they're talking about it a little bit more, not only amongst themselves, but maybe with their other friends as well? I think it's very, very age dependent. Uh, younger patients, millennials, we live in this culture of, you know, taking a picture of what we had for dinner. And so talking about plastic surgery on social media, being able to use their before and afters, I do think that younger patients are much more in tune with that and much more amenable to that. When we go into aging face patients, um, older patients, they tend to be a little bit more conservative. And I think that goes back to where that, where the boomer generation, where their values were as far as what they wanted to talk about and uh, what they thought was appropriate to talk about at the country club. And so when we ask older patients, can we use your before and afters? Can we post this on social media? They tend to be a little bit more reserved. And so I think it's, it almost, I could say is directly linked to the patient's age. Mm -hmm. And what's your opinion? Do you feel like the stigma is shifting that it is becoming more socially acceptable? For sure. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Sieber, how about you? How do you feel? Uh, I think it is. It's just, it's, it's slow. It's, it's super slow. I mean, I don't, I, I think things have gotten busier post COVID just because people have more time and more money. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there is for sure still some stigma there that's kind of slowly, you know, we're slowly turning through that. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Horton, how about you? What's your opinion? Is the stigma shifting? Oh, it's, it's really tough to say. I really think it's personality dependent, but I know I was thinking back in preparation for this video, you know, how many male patients have I done in the last year? And, oh, I haven't seen a lot of them back. I think if they're happy and often <laughs> I might know, I might know their, their spouse or their, their family member. And then I'm like, oh, how's, how's so-and-so? And I'm like, oh, they're great. They're so happy. And I'm like, well, <laughs> like I need to see them. <laughs> like at least I know, I just like, tell, tell Karen I'm really happy. I'm like, okay. So I think maybe they'll tell one or two people, but in terms of broadcasting it on social media, I don't think so. You know, mm -hmm. there was, there was a very prominent fashion designer who had a, a facelift and he published everything he showed. Uh, photos with his drains and his dressings. And I thought, oh, that's so awesome. But is the average person going to do that? No. Right. So. And do you think they'll ever feel comfortable enough to do that? You know, in general, do you think we'll ever get there? <sighs> you know, it's, it's tough to say. I, especially the older male patients, um, universally, if they're above age 50, they say, I don't want to look like Kenny Rogers, you know, when he had, he had a lot of surgery and, you know, there's Lionel Richie, his face, like he still looks great, but his face looks a little bit different and they, they just don't want to look done. And I think they're, they're very worried about looking like a person who's very, you know, very prominent on TV, but I remind them, I say, listen, the, the best plastic surgery is, is all around us, but you would never know. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact, other famous people who've had work done but you can't tell. And I think it's, it's helpful when they can hear uh, affirmations like that. Like you, you're not necessarily going to look weird and not everyone's going to notice, but if, if people pull you aside at a party or, you know, a family reunion and say, Hey, you know, you, you're looking really good. Like, what are you doing? You can say, Oh, it's my keto diet or whatever, but you, you know, you don't have to cop to it, but if you want to, you can be like, Hey, by the way, I just had some work done. And it's, it's certainly nothing to be embarrassed about, but I think everyone has to operate within their own comfort level. Mm -hmm. And do, do you feel like the fear is that they're going to be outed by their plastic surgery and they want it to be that on their terms, whether they feel like sharing it with their family and friends versus. I, I do. Or, yeah. I do. I do. And I think that most of our patients anyway, they just, they want to look like themselves. They want to look natural and then share if they want to, but I don't think they want it to be obvious to everyone else. Yeah. And Dr. Sieber, you mentioned that working um, in San Francisco with all of the tech bros who want to look forever young. Um, do you see a lot of repeat patients, male patients? Yeah, so for the, the tech industry is interesting. So um, traditionally the tech, you know, to work in technology, you're very young. You come out of, of college, you're this very smart young person, you get a job in, in the tech industry. Um, what happens is I'm seeing older patients in their 40s, 50s who are still in tech and feel like they're competing with these young people coming into the industry. So they're getting little touch-ups, little tune-ups, whether that's their eyes, some toxins, some fillers, lasers, so that even though they're older than these people they're maybe competing with, they still look just as young. And I think they feel like they're going to 
be phased out if they look too old. So they're trying to, you know, forever, you know, forever maintain their youth. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Pittman, is it a little different for you because you're in Washington, DC with all of the politicians and lobbyists who maybe, you know, wear their age, like a badge of wisdom? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think that so much, uh, so many of the patients that we see are looking to maintain, but not necessarily look younger. Um, They want to look like a refreshed, older, their older self, more refreshed. Does that make sense? Totally. So just the best version of themselves that they can. Yeah. 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 Because I feel like if my state senator or my U.S. congressman all of a sudden looked totally different, there would be something a little... Right. So Dr. Pittman, Dr. Sieber, Dr. Horton, thank you so much for generously sharing your time with us this evening. Um, You gave us a lot of insights about the men who are getting plastic surgery in your practices and the stigma that surrounds it or doesn't surround it. Um, More to come on that front for sure. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks.